Um, oh, hold on. But I haven't started broadcasting. Okay. So, Dave, if you could hand David the mic, or you hand yourself the mic and mic yourself, please. How's that, buddy? That's looking good. Mm -hmm. You can, you can hand me stuff. No. No? No. Right. Um, one second. Okay. No, I have a card. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, okay, and if you... I'm Jonathan Handel, again, entertainment attorney at Troy Gould in Los Angeles and um, host of Look at LA. I hope many of you tuned in to our earlier discussion with uh, Ned Vaughn of Unite for Strength. And uh, I now have the pleasure to be with David Jolliffe of Membership First, and uh, we will then have Anne Marie Johnson, also of Membership First, uh, joining us. David, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jonathan. It's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Could you start by telling me a little bit and telling our viewers a little bit about your, uh, you know, your personal background? Well, I've been an actor my entire life. Uh, I've been a member of the Screen Actors Guild for 40 years. Uh, um, I've been a member of the Board of Directors since 1996. Uh, I've been a member of 15 of our negotiating committees. I've chaired 10 of them. Uh, those are TV theatrical, commercial performers, dubbing, cable, animation. Wow. I've participated in all of those negotiations. This is my fifth TV theatrical contract negotiation now. Um, I uh, earn uh, a, a, a very comfortable living uh, under this TV theatrical contract, as well as our other contracts, our animation and our commercials contract. So no need to improve the contract then? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, buddy. No. <laughs> there, Not are like some, there are some big holes that we need to, uh, we need to fill and fix. Uh, tell me about that. Tell me about uh, Membership First, uh, the group, and about your uh, platform. Well, Membership First has been around uh, for about uh, four or five years. Um, our platform is, is simply to, uh, to protect performers as a group, uh, to work within the union structure, uh, and to get the best deals possible for, for all performers. And um, you're locked in a contentious campaign. How is the, um, how's the campaign going? Well, the campaign is interesting. Uh, there are some clear, distinct differences between the Membership First and uh, uh, the other group, Unite for Strength. Um, and yeah, there are there are some. It's. I'm sorry that it is contentious in uh, in, in some cases. I wish we could uh, work more cohesively with each other uh, instead of sometimes battling with each other. Uh, sometimes I feel that we're just kind of ships, you know, passing in the in the in the night on some issues. On others, there are clear, distinct philosophical differences. We'll get to those in a minute, because okay. of course I want to explore those, but um, let me ask you this. Is Membership First and um, uh, Doug Allen, are you guys doing a good job at this point in the negotiations? I feel that uh, we're doing the, the best job humanly possible, given the circumstances. Uh, Doug Allen has come into this union uh, with uh, r really, ru you know, really on the run, really running. He's, uh, He's grasped the, uh, the contract. You know, our contract is, is voluminous. It's uh, over 700 pages. It's just single-spaced, as right. you probably know. I, I showed our viewers oh, the earlier did? segment, yeah. yeah. And the TV theatrical, uh, the TV th that's a TV theatrical. The TV part of it is another 250, 300 pages. Uh, Doug understands uh, uh, right off the bat many of the problems and issues that are facing uh, performers today. Um, let me talk a little bit about uh, some of what Doug um, was involved in. Um, mm -hmm. He sought to dissolve the Phase One agreement with AFTRA, uh, you know, as did the group. Um, well, sought, I'm sorry, sought block voting, uh, proportional representation. Well, let's talk about that. Uh, it wasn't initially to uh, the, in, the initial thing wasn't to, s to end Phase One uh, with AFTRA. We initially felt that the Screen Actors Guild does 
uh, one hundred percent of the feature films. The Screen Actors Guild does ninety-five percent of the primetime scripted television, and we felt that the Screen Actors Guild deserved to have some type of proportion, proportional representation on that negotiating committee. Uh, that, that's rather than the fifty-fifty, rather than 50 50, which is phase one. So we uh, we started to float those ideas and uh, and got hammered back from many places uh, within our own board, uh, from certain branches and divisions, uh, and from AFTRA. We then sought, okay, listen, let, we tr we're trying to work with people, let's see, uh, maybe there's another way we can figure this out. Maybe instead of, here's the dynamic that happens, Jonathan. You have the Screen Actors Guild Hollywood that represents two-thirds of the earnings of a contract. They have nine people on a committee of 26, 13 SAG, 13 AFTRA. You could have the 13 AFTRA members vote one way, and two or three New York or branch people vote and make uh, four, let's say one person from SAG mm -hmm. joins with AFTRA. It's now 14, 12. And, and, the and AFTRA could completely outvote the interests of the Screen Actors Guild, who too, the overwhelming majority, remember the last three mm -hmm. years. This is the negotiating committee. The negotiating committee. Mm -hmm. The last three years, Screen Actors Guild, $4 billion earnings in that contract. Mm -hmm. AFTRA, $40 million. 1% of the earnings. Right. And there are, there are distinct differences between Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA, philosophically. Uh, so we felt that it was unfair for uh, uh, 13 members of AFTRA to then join with one or two votes from the Screen Actors Guild and outvote the, the overwhelming majority of the SAG bargaining committee. So they, uh, proportional voting, people are having problems with that. Uh, I thought it was fair. Many of membership first people think that's the fair way to go. In the spirit of compromise, we said, okay, we'll try block voting, meaning that the 13 votes from AFTRA would count as one, the 13 votes of SAG would vote as one. So if the SAG vote was uh, for 13 was 5-8, mm -hmm. th the 8 would carry the day in a, in a unit vote against the AFTRA vote, whatever that was. So you'd, you'd have stalemate in that situation. Well, yeah, at one. least the, the, the institutional interest of the Screen Actors Guild, or the, you know, however the leadership felt, uh, would be protected. So, because uh, we had an instance in our last uh, negotiation where we took a contract five months early, that was the 2005 contract, uh, with no increase in DVD. It's important to know that in 2004 we extended our contract for a year, mm -hmm. which pulled us away from the writers. The writers in terms of expiration. Expiration. The writers were, ex uh, were uh, expiring in May, we were expiring in June. There was a 60-day window, and, and it's a lot of leverage when the unions get real close together. Mm -hmm. those, the more coterminous those contracts become, the better. Well, we felt that uh, that they wanted to extend the contract from 04 to 05 for a year, which completely deleveraged us from the Writers Guild. And they did it under the guise, this is Membership First was not in power yeah, at that time. you said they, the studios. No, no. You <laughs> which they? Uh, the, the current leadership, that, that leadership in 2004 of the Screen Actors Guild, when Melissa was president and Bob Pisano was the executive director. Uh, they pulled us away in a one-year extension from the Writers Guild, completely deleveraged both the writers and the actors, mm -hmm. under the guise that we're going to go fight in 05 for DVD home video. We're going to fight for it. Well, we get into that negotiation five months early. Uh, I can't really go into the details of negotiating committee votes, but I can tell you that the majority of the Screen Actors Guild committee did not want to settle five months early in January uh, of 05, when the contract expired the end of June, uh, for no increase in home video DVD. And that created, you know, some animus and tension with, hey, listen, we're representing the majority of the contract. How is it that the people that do no movies and a few television shows are outvoting us in a negotiating situation? So that's, that's our position on that, you, you know, uh, so. Um, membership first, in fact, has controlled the Guild um, since 2005. Correct. Been, been the majority. Are, um, are actors better off than they were three years ago? I think actors are better off in many circumstances. Uh, we just raised the, the pension cap from 6000 to $8,000 a month. Uh, the pension accrual rate at the Screen Actors Guild is 3.5%. That's gone up. You know, at after it's 1.7 on the first 50. Mm -hmm. And uh, 1.5 for the next 150. It's less than half the accrual rate. Uh, of the Screen Actors Guild, a little interesting thing. Uh, you know the actor's life, it's mm -hmm. cyclical, and you'll hear more from me about that when it comes to qualified voting, the actor's life, that's right. ups and downs, and why do you, you know, hit somebody when they're down. Uh, but let's say you had a great year as an actor doing filmed type of work, television shows, uh, what single camera scripted television shows, and you made $200,000 at Sony, you made $200,000 at 
Universal, NBC Universal, and you made $200,000 at Disney. That's a $600,000 a year. Under the Screen Actors Guild, you would be able to accrue on that total $600,000 because the Screen Actors Guild pension plan allows you to accrue $225,000 per member. Per, per member, member. Per, I mean per employer. Per employer. Per, employer. per year. You. Per year. Mm -hmm. 225 per employer per year. AFTRA, 200 per member per year. So if you had the exact same situation at AFTRA, you'd only get a $200,000 credit and you would only accrue at 1.7% for the first 50,000 and 1.5% for the, for, the, for the next versus year. three times 225 is 675 and at a higher percentage uh, rate. That's right. So that's at, a, a, at more than double. Right. So, yeah, um, right. yeah. So, when you ask me, are, are, are things better uh, since Membership First was around? Yes, because Membership First has identified critical things. Membership First identified that, that a sister union was out uh, undermining and undercutting our basic cable contracts right after we had negotiated higher residuals in that area. Uh, and we're out there protecting members from this kind of predatory practice. Yeah, I think, you know, there, there's, of course there's always room for improvement. Yes, we, 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 need, to, we need to work on an ATA deal and get our agents uh, franchised. Uh, and there are ways of doing that. And membership First defeated that. Membership was First was not around when that was defeated. Well, Performers yeah. Alliance, the, a lot of Actually, lot Performers of Alliance wasn't around then. It was, right, but it was a lot of the same people who well, were there are, Membership there First. If you there. actually look at the, at the list of, of Performers Alliance and the list of the members of Membership First, it's there may be 10% of the same people. Including 10% of the same leadership? Well, there's some, I mean, I've been around since Performers right. Alliance. Uh, uh, um, Steve Barr, I think, has been around since Performers Alliance. Uh, but there are many new people, Valerie Harper and Elliot Gould and, and Francis Fisher and Renee Taylor and Joe Bologna, uh, and, and on and on and on, that, that are all members of Membership First that were never members of Performers Alliance. And the pension and health, by the way, mm -hmm. you said it's 3.5? Uh, 3.5 accrual rate. Accrual exactly. rate. What was it before uh, Membership First got involved? Uh, it's it's been 3.5 for a while. I won't. I don't want to take credit for the 3.5 okay. percent, but I'm going to take. I will say that membership first is there to ensure and make sure that those things stay the same. Also, it's important to know that the board of directors is a different entity than than the tr than the trustees. Right. So of the it's, pension, it's the trustees, the pension health fund. Correct. Right. So it's an absolute valid argument. If somebody says, "Oh, Jolliffe's taking credit for the accrual rate," I don't want to take credit for the accrual rate. Uh, that's done by the trustees. Uh, but membership first in the board of directors uh, is very uh, is, is a, has a watchful eye on what's going on on those things, and we put people on the trusteeship of the PNH plan that are that champion things like the raise up from six thousand to eight thousand in the in the pension. Are actors better off that we're now in stalemate? And in fact, the SAG agreement is less lucrative for talent. Interesting, huh? Than the after agreement. Yeah, um, yeah I'll tell you why they're better off, Jonathan. Um, without membership first, you most likely would have this deal that AFTRA took. That when you, when you look at that deal and study it, there are some aspects of that that just devastate actors. When you take uh, uh, that Sony and MGM and Paramount and, and Disney and, and NBC Universal and all of our signatories, uh, that, an, that, that another union signed off on allowing them to work non-union, I'm talking about the thresholds and made for new media at mm -hmm. $15,000, which nobody does. Everything's under $15,000 a minute. Well, in the jurisdictional threshold at 25. Yeah. But with an exception for covered performers, we'll get to that. Yeah, well, let's talk about it. I mean, the covered yeah. performer is, uh, you know, th yeah, but that doesn't guarantee it to be union. I mean, how is it that the Screen right. Actors Guild could put together a, a, an agreement with our signatories that says, hey, here, open up this entire new space, non-union. Can you imagine if we did something like this in the commercials contract? I've chaired many of the, let me just finish, the commercial, yeah. the commercial contract. I've chaired a few of those negotiations, too. Um, I mean, uh, you, people need to know that if I'm on that commercial negotiating committee, there's no way I would allow the advertisers, the advertising agencies who have another bargaining unit called the JPC, the Joint Policy mm -hmm. Committee, I would never be part of, I mean, I could get outvoted, but I would always champion that there's no way we could allow Procter & Gamble, if they shot a commercial for under a certain amount of money, let's say $45,000 for the internet, that they could do it non-union. But the you can't allow that to happen. These are our signatories. They need to work with us and we need to work with them. But one difference is, isn't it, that they're competing against non-union competitors uh, that can hire 24-year-old kids with a bunch of college credits mm -hmm. who you know, have at least some ability to act. Mm -hmm. um, how do these studios effectively compete with that non-union talent unless at some budget threshold mm -hmm. they're allowed to go non-union? And by the way, I will say that 25000 is ridiculous.
particularly high, but there is the covered performer uh, exception to that. How right. do these but guys the, compete with non Well, as you said, the 25000 is ridiculously, ridiculously high, but another union's already approved that and called that groundbreaking, by the way. Mm. Uh, how do you compete with that? What we do is, without getting into details, because we're still in a negotiation, uh, we have uh, low-budget film agreements that completely address this exact same issue. We have agreements that address budgets down to dollar zero. But you use our members and you make it union. Uh, again, it is anathema to membership first that, that Paramount can go make work where everything's going to go made for new media, uh, non-union. We just, listen, the Screen Actors Guild Board of Directors on July 26th of this year voted 68 to nothing uh, to, a, to endorse and approve core principles. Those core principles simply are that our signatories must be union. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of the description of a signatory, isn't it? Mm -hmm. okay. And that a, a made for new media production has to have some type of residual somewhere, somehow, down the line. Which most of them do under the after deal, but there is a no. hole in that. Where, where, uh, tell me the after deal, and I'm not trying to be... Uh, Deriv cute. Derivative productions have uh, residuals when replayed in new media. But tell me... Uh, you know, so if you do a, 20, you know, a thing based on 24, and... At what threshold? None. Yeah. There is no threshold there. So uh, that's that's from dollar zero. On derivative. On derivative. Right. And on original, yes, there's a uh, fifteen thousand uh, dollar per minute per minute threshold. Right. That's which is very high. You know, there's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. I've criticized that threshold. Mm -hmm. I think it's ridiculously high as well. Typical new media is two to five thousand. Where is where where even in the fifteen thousand is there a residual? Above fifteen thousand. There isn't one, Jonathan. There is no. A there is a twenty five thousand dollars a minute on a pay platform, which would be like an iTunes no, platform. No, 15, 15, the 25,000 is a, on is a jurisdictional. Pay on a pay platform, on, on ad-supported websites, uh, uh, NBC.com, something made for NBC.com, right, NBC.com, right. NBC ad-supported, there is no residual. That's correct. For pay platform, there is. That's what I just said. That's what I was That's saying. Right. And, so, and if you're doing something for it, if you're doing, <laughs> hey, you just booked a great job. You're the star of the new NBC.com show. Great. What's my residual? Nothing. Right. Right. We can't sign off on that. Uh, now, maybe, in, listen, we are going to send something out to the membership, and we're going to lay all of this out, and we're going to ask the membership the question. Do you want us to take the deal that's on the table from the AMPTP 63008, or do you want us to continue to try to, to get some of this stuff out of the way? That leads to a very good question, if I may say so, mm -hmm. which is without the... <laughs> because, you're <laughs> asking, because you're asking it? Or? Because I'm asking okay. it. Which is that um, you've acknowledged, um, and Marie has acknowledged, that um, you really can't get the 75% threshold, uh, at, at least at this time, at least without the support of New York. Correct. Um, I would think that's a correct... I would which, think is that's the, which is the threshold required for... Right, right. Yeah, right. Well, it's a tragedy, in my opinion, uh, that... Again, the board voted 68 to nothing for the core principles, and we have a deal on the table that the AMPTP, AMPTP smells, you know, that they could get this, maybe get this thing through, and they have people actually helping them with their cause by undermining what we're trying to accomplish. Right, so, yeah, I wish, I wish the New York board would. I understand, but let's leave aside the criticisms, which I understand, and go to the reality of negotiation, which mm -hmm. is how do you gain enough leverage to change new media those new media provisions when you can't threaten or actually strike. That's right, the center. Right now, I think that I, I really don't think that a lot of actors, you know, because I ask actors, people say to me, well, why don't you just take the after deal? And I say, here's the after deal. No, you, no guaranteed union juris jurisdiction under 15,000 minute, no residual made for new media, no mileage increase, force majeure protections, gone. Uh, French hours on movies, uh, the, the Taft-Hartley provision going from 30 days where you have to work 30 and join the union and now is up to 90, uh, and other things. And, and they say, that's what the deal is? And I go, yeah. And they say, you can't accept that. And we go, yeah. So I don't think actors really quite are getting what that deal is. But again, is. let's go, you know, negotiation is a combination of feeling what one should get with realism about what one can get. A negotiation is not a shopping spree. You don't get everything you want. It seems fairly likely that if you dropped what the AMPTP considers the roadblocks, the two new media 
primary new media changes you're looking for, mm -hmm. that they would negotiate at least mm -hmm. as to some of the other issues that you mentioned, which, by the way, mm -hmm. I agree that, you know, that many or most of them are things that actors should negotiate. And uh, as I say, I agree with some of the new media, mm -hmm. but where's your leverage to change what they've said they won't do? I think our leverage will grow when actors see how damaging the current deal on the table is to us individually and as a collective whole, as a union. So you'll gain the prospect of a 75? Hopefully. Um, and hopefully people that continue to undermine us, for whatever reason, uh, will come join us. I, I, I hope that, that a group called Unite for Strength would unite with us. I've, I've heard that Unite for, Unite for Strength has said that they want everything membership first wants and more. Well, come on, come unite with us. Stop sniping at us. We're, you know, we're trying to accomplish this. Um, anyway. SAG has said that there are, are ongoing discussions with the studios. The studios has sa have said that there aren't, and the at least one common perception around town is that fairly informal telephone conversations are being characterized as discussions when the studios say these are not negotiations or or discussions now. Are there or are there not negotiations going on now? That's a studios? question that's a question that you'd have to ask our either our president or our chief negotiator. You don't know. Those are questions that you would have to ask Doug or Alan Rosenberg. Do you know the answer and not comfortable answering it? I would ask you to ask those two gentlemen that question. I'll take that as a <laughs> as an as an <laughs> answer on that. Take it as an honor, take what it is, but that's uh that's how I have to answer that question. That's, uh, yeah. What is the position on increasing, at, at this time, in this negotiation, the DVD residual? What do you mean, what's, the, what's, our, what's our position? Right. Uh, uh, okay. Again, we're in the middle of a negotiation. Uh, I can tell you that the DVD residual hasn't changed ever. Well, there might be some, Carol might argue with that, but um, we've had the same DVD residual for two decades plus, uh, and in that, res in that residual, our pension and health benefit, keyword benefit, is taken out. 13.5% of your DVD residual is taken out of your check. If you got a DVD check for 100 bucks, you don't get the 100. You get uh, whatever the math is, 80, 80, 80 something, 87, right, 86.50, and the other 13.50 goes to the plan. And the other thing that's curious about that is that you don't get a $100 credit you only get the $86.50 credit because credit, they right. right credit for, for PNH for your jurisdiction PNH, yeah for your for, for uh, your uh, qualification. qualification yeah right. for health and a pension credit so there are without saying too much there are places for improvement there that I think are that can be accomplished with a 24 year old formula and the DGA having passed on it, the writers guild passed on it mm -hmm. after in both their daytime and prime time passed on it mm -hmm. and no strike threat is there realistically any degree of leverage here well, on, keep, on that issue? You keep going to that, and uh, we only have the leverage that our membership has. And if our membership continues to be bombarded with that we are weak, that we are fractured, uh, that uh, that a certain group, membership first or whatever, is is asking for the moon, you know, you you know this contract, Jonathan. You know that what's on the table now are core issues. Uh, we are not chasing rainbows in this negotiation. We are fighting for our collective lives economically. Without leverage. That's the difficulty. We're here. trying. We are building leverage every day. Hopefully people that see me here or, or later when they see Anne-Marie and, and hear us speak and see the information that we're putting out, that we'll, they'll, they'll sit back and say, you know something? Uh, these guys are nuts. These guys are looking out for us. And you know, I believe in them and I believe that they can accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. These are, again, uh, you know, we've been accused of overreaching. Uh, the DGA, how can I say it? The DGA and the WGA and AFTRA have accepted a pattern that tentatively we have possibly bought into, which is that 3% of the total applicable minimum. When, so when an ER moves over, let's, go, let's talk about this for a second. When an, an episode mm -hmm. of ER moves over to the internet. Rerun on the internet. Rerun on the internet. Two mm -hmm. things happen. The term of art that's being used now in the industry is cannibalization. That rerun on the network goes away because they replace it with some other programming. But they do rerun it on NBC.com. 
That current template, when you move that over to actors, uh, it's 24 free days for a new television show in one year, 17 days for another show. So a show mm -hmm. like ER that's been on for 10, 11, 12 years. Free days meaning no residual. No days. residual. Right. So let's talk about quickly what the residuals are in network television. They're 100% of compensation. For the first rerun? For all reruns. For all reruns. On network, yeah. Uh -huh. 100, uh, all, all reruns. Well, you look at that first line, you go, yee! <laughs> you know, right. uh, I'm starring in the show, I'm making 50 grand a William, and the rerun, 50,000. That's not how it works. The, then you read the next sentence, and it says, up to these ceilings. The current ceiling on an hour television show is $3,290. $3,290. So if you work, you did, let's say you did three days on ER, you are fortunate enough to make $4,000. Your residual isn't going to be $4,000, it's going to be $3,290. Let's say you did a day and your day rate's $2,000. If you can get that, if you can anymore, uh, your residual is going to be $2,000. Let's say you're per, a day per run. Per run. Per run. Let's mm -hmm. say on the network, let's say you're a day player and you worked for $759. Your residual is going to be $759. That's, ni that's what keeps actors alive, Jonathan. These are the mm -hmm. residuals that keep all of us in the acting community alive. Now that residual goes away that network residual, but they go and put it on NBC.com and they run it for 17 days for free. Let's say now they say, okay, we're going to run it for another six months. The residual is going to be 3% of minimum. Not if you made, if you worked a day and you made $5,000 that day, you're not going to get 3% of $5,000. You're going to get 3% of minimum, $759. Mm -hmm. And the math is $22.77 for six months. Now let's say they let's say that that uh, that the network says you know we're going to run it for those seventeen days for free, and then at the end of the year I'll finish up quickly at the end. Yeah, but no, this is important fine. stuff. I'm it's just, important for people to know. No, I'm just picking up my next question. I'll let when you, you translate these formula to actual dollars and the actual actor's working life, it's devastating. I mean I don't use this word. I, I'm very careful using this word. It's a, it's, it's devastating when you're. You know, your $759 residual just turned to $22.77, but it can get worse. Let's say they run it the 17 days. Now they want to run it the last two weeks of the year. I mean, I don't know if you've read what the deal is out there, but that is, they will now be able to carve up the second six months in 126th in weekly increments. So prorates, in other words. Yes. So now it runs for one week at the end of the year. You don't even get the 22.77. You get 80 cents. Now call us wacky, but we think that's not so good. But we're even we're willing to, in, in order to keep the town moving, in order to keep the process working. You know, we're saying, okay, but you know, okay, we'll go along with that. But we can't go along with this thing, Universal, where you guys are going to go out and do non-union in this space that's going to that many of us and, and, and everyone in the industry believes is going to explode. Anyway, uh, so I've been going on too long on these, but it's important to get this information out. It sounds like the strategy, given the, a the absence of a strike authorization capability right now, mm -hmm. sounds like the strategy is to sit in stalema stalemate for a bunch of months while you try to persuade the members. I'm not, uh, listen, uh, there, are, there are strategies. I've, I think I've been very open and honest about uh, where we are as far as strike authorization, uh, uh, maybe two. Um, but I believe that if push comes to shove, I believe in my fellows. I believe in my fellow artists and actors that, given the circumstances and them understanding what this deal is, that they would rally around the cost. So how, why haven't you sought a strike authorization yet? Because we're trying to make a deal without doing that. And, and you, know, it's, you know, it's disruptive now, but that's, that's a very disruptive thing to do. Not without striking, I'm saying, but without getting the authorization so the threat is a weapon. Let's, listen, we'll, we're going to ask our members what they think about the deal, and that'll help us. When is that referendum or survey going to be? Soon. Within the next four weeks or Soon. so? Soon. Ask Doug and Alan. <laughs> I'll, in, I'll invite them to come. I've yeah, invited please, Zach to... Please uh, do. You know, listen, I wish that you, you interviewed Ned earlier. Well, I'm sorry? Ned, Ned yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, I would wish that, you know, I was here and Ned was there, or actually Ned and I were sitting side by side. Or with Anne-Marie and with Amy or whatever, and we could talk through this stuff. I asked him why he wouldn't debate. Yeah. And? I'll let you watch the, uh, the video replay. Okay. Okay. Um, one concern that I've got in terms of the union having leverage is that the longer it takes to make a deal, mm -hmm. 
um, the less likely it is that the studios will allow you to retain the June 30th expiration date. And since the Writers Guild expiration date is May 1st, if you could retain that date, mm -hmm. uh, then you have the threat of a dual strike three mm -hmm. years from now, and you've got real leverage. Well, I appreciate you recognizing that, how important it is to have those two. I, where were you in 2004, Jonathan? I needed you. When, uh, when it was just me and Anne Marie and a couple others trying to convince uh, the then majority that uh, deleveraging us and doing a year extension from 2004 to 05 was not the, not the right thing to do. But yeah, no, that, that expiration date is important. I, I understand and recognize that. Doesn't that mean, though, that the longer the stalemate continues, the more uh, ammunition the studios have to say, you know, if we get a deal done in December, they'll say, you know, these are three-year deals. We'll give you expiration in December of 2011, and the writers are expiring May 2011. And once again, you're in a situation where the writers are more are likely to say, like they said now, we're not going to work without a contract mm -hmm. just to meet your expiration. Anything's possible. After his deal expires, when? I don't remember the date. I think it was about three years from when they're... Uh, June 30, right. 2011. Right. From, you know, roughly three years from when they made their deal. Okay. But the relationship with AFTRA is so strange right now that to get AFTRA to strike is, you know, or to threaten to strike is not so realistic, is it? You, you have... I, 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 will, I, I recognize the end of the contract date is important given the end of the WGA contract. It's self-evident. And the end of the WGA contract is more important than the end of the AFTRA contract. Un understood. I understand that. In terms of, you know, attempting to do, to get proportional uh, representation, mm -hmm. block voting, mm -hmm. um, dissolving phase one. Mm -hmm. no. Okay, go ahead. Isn't there a, wasn't there a mistaken strategy, which is that to try to do that, you know, with only six months, six, you know, months or so, or less in some cases, remaining towards contract expiration, that you really ran the risk, uh, well, you, you, you almost pushed after out the door and then they finished the job and you ran the risk that those maneuvers, those attempts would explode in your face and then you wouldn't have enough runway left to try to repair things. As I explained, we were trying to make phase one reasonable. Uh, and fair for for the for both institutions and for actors. Uh, you know, when AFTRA did leave, uh, you know, remember uh, it was AFTRA that left Phase One. That's so, right. So you know, you can say, yeah, you pushed them or whatever. They left. Uh, they left under a false premise. They claim that uh, that the Screen Actors Guild went after the Bold and the Beautiful and asked them to decertify. It's an out and out lie. We have the letter from Susan Flannery, the star of that show, saying that they were never approached by the Screen Actors Guild to decertify. Why did the Allens even take the meeting, though? Because an, a Shouldn't they have be, said, you be, know... Well, listen, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? Uh, but, you know, even in hindsight, do you say to a member of the Screen Actors Guild, I won't talk to you? A member of the Screen Actors Guild had a concern. Uh, my understanding is that Doug and Allen met with her uh, and, at the, and at the end of the conversation said, Bold and the Beautiful is an after show and you need to talk to after. Uh, so, you know, it's after that left phase one. But wasn't it a mistake? And, 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 yeah. and, and just let me finish up on that. Because uh, we're having, it's, this is a also, I, I like having this discussion with you, but it's also, a, we're in a political election right now. That's right. And I would ask the people that are running against membership first, Unite for Strength, the second after left, where were they? These are the people that are so adamant that we must negotiate jointly and we're stronger. Where were they? Not organized into a slate just yet, but well, where they were was 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 putting together an affected member voting campaign, and thro and throwing that into the mix, as mm -hmm. we're going into a negotiation, and again the irony is you know uh, unite for strength, uh, how is it how do you unify behind telling a certain group of members by the way we're not we're not, you know you're not going to vote on contracts that's not unifying that's that's a divisive thing. But haven't you criticized? after for not having that for allowing weathermen and, and TV broadcasters to vote let me finish to um, to vote on a contract they don't work under mm -hmm. haven't isn't it also the case that the writers guild has affected member voting in no. terms of the writers CBS guild. the CBS news writers cannot vote on the theatrical and television contract and isn't it also the case that actors equity has affected voting and they, I've looked that up writers equity uh, my understanding is that it's a uh, it's kind of a unit voting like if you're working in a show or you've done it for the last eight years I'm not very familiar with it so I really shouldn't talk six about years it. says it's six years um, here's the thing all actors 
members, all actors should have a right to vote in their union. Uh, even, the, even the weathermen and the... Uh, no. People who do not act for a living in AFTRA, uh, I think Alan even said it out loud, uh, you know, the, I think he talked about the weatherman in uh, Peoria, uh, you, know, sh you know, shouldn't be voting. Uh, AFTRA took a cynical, uh, even when they got as cynical as putting out a YouTube video with a weatherman and a weather lady who actually work in Peoria saying, I'm the weatherman from Peoria and I'm voting yes on your The Actor contract. Listen, uh, this issue is, uh, in my opinion, uh, the working life of an actor is cyclical and at the bottom end of that cycle, I don't think you should be taking their vote away to uh, vote on a contract that they know. Let me follow up on a question I asked a moment ago, which is in terms of trying to adjust phase one, mm -hmm. which I, you know, largely don't disagree with. I mean, a, you know, a 1% difference, you know, in earnings it's an enormous difference. It's not a one percent difference. <laughs> not a one percent difference. It's one percent. Ninety nine percent earnings. We did ninety nine percent earnings. Yeah, right. yeah. That that mm -hmm. level of, of, of difference, a ninety eight percent difference, mm -hmm. is enormous. But the question I've got for you is, again, wasn't it a mistake to try to do that at this time? If you mm -hmm. had said, you know, we negotiate the contract and then now we're going to push for that, mm -hmm. well, you know, then you've got three. If it blows up in your face, you've got three years, two and a half years, to try to fix that problem before you've got the next negotiation. But you did it within six months, and I don't understand that because you created an effective competitor. Once you let them go out mm -hmm. on their own, once you push them almost to the door, you're right, after is the one who left, um, you've turned this from uh, the, fr the phrase three guilds into essentially the phrase four unions. Mm -hmm. And now after is in a much better position to, as you to say, do what? to undercut. That's and right. They're much stronger. They're a stronger mm -hmm. union. They're gaining market share. Mm -hmm. You've created a strong. Well, let me ask. Let me ask you about that. I'm a member of AFTRA, okay. And as a member of AFTRA, I'm telling that leadership to stop undermining and undercutting my acting contracts. You cannot find one AFTRA contract that the Screen Actors Guild undercuts. It's important. Well, except for except for right now, because you're operating under the old deal. Let me read. And AFTRA got the increases. Let me read. Let me read you. Isn't that right? What was it again? You're, at, you're working under a deal that didn't get 3.5% increases while AFTRA did. So right now, right. you're actually undercutting AFTRA. Right. Well, then how come all the shows aren't coming to the Screen Actors Guild? Because the producers see a compliant union. Let me read you something that was put into effect at the AFTRA convention of 1999. This was brought in by Kent McCord and signed off by many people. Kent, and, and Kent is, is one of the Membership First folks. He's a Membership First, current Membership right. First. There are many. Mm -hmm. There are thousands no, of No, I'm us. just... Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this is... Um, uh, the CVR, it's called 99 CVR 17R. And this says, whereas actors and other performers will continue to be employed in both AFTRA and SAG jurisdiction, and whereas differences may exist in wages and working conditions between contracts, be it resolved that the unions make every effort to coordinate with each other and to compare and understand the provisions existing in each other's major contracts that may benefit performers and be it further resolved that the unions seek to bargain provisions that benefit performers and in their totality raise terms and conditions for work under those contracts. And be it further resolved that this resolution be effective upon its adoption by the Screen Actors Guild. And I brought that motion to the Screen Actors Guild right after this was done and it was approved by the Screen Actors Guild. So now, I ask you, how is it that a resolution like that is in both unions and the Screen Actors Guild goes and puts out a basic cable scripted, uh, you know, drama contract mm -hmm. with residuals from the first residual on and after goes to our same pe the, the same producers uh, look at that's so raven mm -hmm. that's so raven was a sag show they do the spin-off cory in the house after lower terms and conditions well i ask you because you're involved more in those unions well, I think I, it, why I, do you think they did that why do you think they hmm. aren't following the 99 cbr well let me think uh possibly trying to get market share and by doing and by undercutting my wages to do it and I'm telling AFTRA again I'm a member of AFTRA stop it stop and this is you know uh, you know you, you, they, they, they go and they say well if we didn't do it if we didn't if we didn't give them 15 free rerun days not reruns we run days uh, shows would go to Canada well, tell that to the, to the cast of Kyle XY that's shooting in Vancouver uh, it's, it's, yeah, anyway, it's, it's, it's very troubling to us. Uh, we have a hard time with, with what's going on there. And, uh, anyway, that's that. 
How do you, um, you know, given the criticisms of AFTRA, given the attempt unsuccessfully to defeat the AFTRA deal and the um, negativity mm -hmm. between the two unions? I mean, you know, as I said um, uh, earlier in the afternoon, uh, they're both in the same building in uh, in L.A. and I can't imagine what elevator rides are <laughs> like. You know, retreat to your corners and behave yourselves. It's un it's uh, un listen. It's how do you how do you repair that relationship? I think it's repairable. Um, with the I current I leadership of SAG. Yeah, I'm I'm, t I'm current leadership of SAG, right. and I'm telling you or whoever's watching that it's repairable. That we need to sit in the room together. We need to. We have deep philosophical differences. I just gave you an example. You know, we believe that uh, on A and E and Lifetime and these networks with the producers that we have, this, you know, shows on that where where actors get residual from day one, that after should be doing the same thing. Uh, and we need to talk that stuff through. Uh, after calls, <laughs> after calls itself the great organizer. They're really great at organizing. Well, I won't use the pejorative on what it is when you you when you take a contract from another union and lower those terms in order to get the coverage, but. I would ask people when they're watching uh, cable news tonight, after is a broadcaster union. They, that's, that's one thing that they solely do. Uh, all of those cable news networks are non-union. And then I would ask you to look at the newscasters who are members of AFTER and say to yourself, how are these union members working on a non-signatory? Those are philosophical differences that, I th that we can fix. You know, and I, and, and how do you fix differences that great as you as you said. I think we need to have clear jurisdictional lines. I think there needs to be uh, uh, conversations between AFTRA and SAG and say, listen, you know, Roberta Reardon has said digital changes everything. If digital changes everything, then all of these swaths are going to cut, you know, all ways. Uh, I think that there's a way to, to, to carve up the jurisdiction so that certain types of shows belong in, in the Actors Union, other shows belong at AFTRA. Because, you know, when you talk about a merger, Jonathan, if you're going to merge the Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA and extinguish the Screen Actors Guild, which just is an amazing comment to me, but, uh, or... Is that what it, what it would effectively do, given that there are far more members of the Screen Actors Guild than of AFTRA? Would it really be extinguishing well, the Well, what, what, what about the... Yeah, well, here's the thing. Here's, the, here's what happens. You take the Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA and you put them together. You're still going to have to have the actor portion of this... New union, whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to have the broadcaster portion of this union. You're going to have to have the recording artist portion. Well, we already have an actors union. What percent and, and of well, AFTRA... Well, I was going to tell you about shared services, but we can talk about okay. what, what percent of AFTRA is actually broadcasters and is recording artists? I don't know. It's small, isn't it? I, I, I don't know. I, 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 you know. I, I, I don't know. I have many of the answers, Jonathan, that one I don't have. Talk about shared services. Shared services was, is a uh, proposal that we've had... Uh, and tried to present for many years where SAG and AFTRA would work in conjunction with each other, uh, same legal department, same residual department, same fax machines, same computers, and, 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 uh, and in that shared entity uh, you would have, okay, listen, uh, th this hour scripted drama on A&E uh, cable is going to be, uh, you know, the actor's show. Uh, this a uh, new game show with Howie Mandel is going to be an after show. Uh, this project that Don Henley is doing as a recording artist is going to be in that, in that uh, piece of this, of this shared entity. And the actor stuff would all be at the higher SAG rates. You'd hope. Now that's another thing too, you know, uh, you, you think this thing through. We have SAG rates that are up here. We have after rates, basic cable with, with the 15 free reruns and other things down here. If you merge those entities, what really happens with those contracts? Those, you know, like the Army Wives and uh, 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 Ben Bratt's new show, uh, uh, The Cleaner, and which is also AFTRA, One Hour, shot at Radford. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, those are term contracts. Those have a term to them where they don't just go away. And you're going to have to negotiate those things. Uh, we come up from a position that we already have these high standard contracts and we should defer to the higher standard contract. Why would, in terms of this sort of um, merger, as it were, or relationship with SAG in control of actors, why would AFTRA ever agree to that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless it benefited AFTRA. You know, this, the last plan, uh, there was a lot of AFTRA philosophy and, and institutional stuff that, was, that went into you know, conventions and things like that. Listen, uh, I, 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 I'm very clear on, on my position. We, we have an actors' union, the Screen Actors Guild. But if it's not realistic to expect AFTRA 
to do what you're what you're saying should be done. Where does that take you? Well, I think the members. I mean, you can stand for your principle, but if well, does it take you anywhere? I don't think I'm an I don't think I'm an unusual member actor of an actors union. I think uh, my feeling. But you weren't able to defeat the after deal. So you may not well, be unusual. There are a lot of people who did want to, but there were more who wanted to approve it. It went from ninety some odd percent down to sixty two percent. Yeah, it did. Uh, in a two week campaign, uh, and I think if we had more time, we could have defeated it. So. What should current after members do? Should they withdraw from the union or just refuse uh, work on after shows? I, wouldn't, I would never say something like that. Um, we, again, what I've said is that we need to sit with AFTRA and, and work these things out. Um, and, and, and work it out. I read you the CVR. Work it out to the betterment of the member, not to the betterment of the Screen Actors Guild or to the betterment of AFTRA. This, this, these, these institutions and unions are to protect me and Anne Marie and, and all other members and actors of the Screen Actors, members, performers of the Screen Actors Guild and or AFTRA. AFTRA has signed a deal that's going to be in place for three years, yeah. and that's going to, if SAG gets better terms, that's still undercutting. In <laughs> <laughs> so isn't a producer on a new show just going to say, I'm signing AFTRA? Was that a... Some are self... Some questions and answers are just self-evident, yeah. So that was a yes, then? That would be... Well, I would think that you could come to that conclusion. I don't so mean to be evasive, but it's... So how does getting a better deal for SAG uh, help, then? Because if, if it's just going to drive producers of new shows to sign after it. Mm-hmm. Good. How, did, how does it, uh, how does it well, help uh, SAG? Let me ask you this. How is it that uh, a television show that is a one-hour scripted dramatic television show uh, just because there's no film in the camera, everything else is the same, but because there isn't film in the camera, but it's digital, all of a sudden a new, another union go, go in and cause that type of chaos. That doesn't... How does that happen? Well, that doesn't really answer my question, and until I become an actor and run for the board, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to be answering these questions. And uh, yeah, well, when yeah, I you know, do, I'll ask you to, uh, to give me some uh, tutoring and how to act. And uh, be more than happy to, and you can give me some tutoring, even though when I can spiel off this contract language, I'm, you know, I don't know how this stuff it just it gets in my head. It's frightening, isn't it? It's amazing, isn't it? Anyway, buddy, uh, you want to talk to Anne-Marie for a little while? or? Uh, no, I've got a, a oh, couple okay. more questions before we... Uh, in there. Before we do that, okay. um, you've got challenges with regard to New York and the RBDs, regional branch divisions, in terms of um, a lot of disagreement with the Hollywood uh, folks, with, with the membership first. How do you repair those relationships? That, that, uh, is a, is a, that's a good question. And it's, listen, I, I, it's not good that we have this, um, these misunderstandings between New York, uh, some of the RBD members, and Hollywood. Um, I, I don't relish, you know, these arguments and the, and the different philosophies. I have, a, I have a very difficult time with some things that New York does. They have a difficult time with things that we do. Um, you know, this is the contract that we live and breathe here in Hollywood. Um, not to say that in New York it's not important also, but, you know, we do a lot of television here. We do a lot of, and film around the country, because, you know, the film is not Hollywood-based anymore. It's studio-based with our signatories, Sony and Paramount and MGM and all those. Uh, I, I hope it's repairable. I would do everything I could to, to try to repair uh, those, those relationships. Because um, obviously we're stronger when we're all on the same page. Uh, I take uh, umbrage when New York puts out press releases in the middle of our negotiation completely undermining us. Uh, it doesn't help. Uh, when we, you know, we take votes trying to strengthen us, and it's, well, anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, I think these relationships are repairable. I would reach out to all of my fellows in New York and the branches to try to do so, and, and, uh, and, 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 and wish nothing more than we can all get on the same page. Let me ask you what I think will be one last question um, that isn't, controversial, I don't think, as between you and the challengers, but is a really hard question, okay. which is that this industry and this town is facing a lot of competition from Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. um, we're being driven towards content production, yeah. and the economics of content production are difficult because it's done manually, whereas new media distribution, you know, Hollywood used to control. They controlled all the distribution. They yeah. controlled the traditional media distribution. Right. 
you know, the theatrical home video. I mean, they don't own the theater chains, but nonetheless, well, that's that was called a monopoly. Yeah. That's right, the Paramount decree. But nonetheless, uh, well, they have interest in some of them now. And in any case, that's really part of the old media in industry. But the new media distribution is being controlled by Silicon Valley, Apple, iTunes, mm -hmm. um, YouTube, UStream that we're on right now. YouTube and Ustream should have been created by the studios. There was no audiovisual entertainment other than the studios and wedding videos before these guys arose and the studios missed a beat. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of reasons why producing in Hollywood is more expensive in addition to the fact that it's you know done manually. Uh, inflated executive salaries, uh, inflated star salaries. That's mm -hmm. an economic difference within, within SAG, probably to some extent within AFTRA as well, and the overhead created by unions the higher wage rates, the 700 pages of rules that have to be followed, meal penalties, mm -hmm. am I, do I have a lawyer, hopefully me, uh, <laughs> to explain this thing to me. Um, how should the industry deal with this challenge from Silicon Valley? Well, you know, if I had all the answers. Uh, You'd be running a studio. I'd be running a studio, not running for the SAG board, but I have some. Um, in fact, we talk about that all the time in our <laughs> in my little group. We spend so much time doing this that geez, we should just be running a studio. We have you know all of these actors and all of this. And then you'd be oppressing the unions. And then, yeah, get, 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 get the unions under our thumb. Um, obviously, we need to work with Silicon Valley. We need to work with with uh, the Googles and the and the CNETs and and, uh, and these outlets. Uh, and we need to adjust. And we need to bob and weave. And, and we need to stay in the game. Uh, maybe that's something people miss about membership first, that uh, they think that we're just uh, old dinosaurs holding on to old ways. No, we're, we are, we're bobbing and weaving and we're, we're trying to stay up with everything and we're willing to work with everybody. Uh, uh, but we also have, we have, a, 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 we have an ace in our hole, which is that we have the most talented actors and performers in the world that know how to hit their marks, that know how to... Uh, get you on and off a set. Silicon Valley's not going to start creating content though because of the economics, but how do you compete with the fact that the distribution, new media distribution business has such better economics than but content distrib production? What are you going to distribute? That's certainly true. Content, 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 content. who creates created? the content? We do. The writers, the directors. We have organizations that protect us collectively. Those collective institutions will work within the confines and the, and the framework of these new media as they, as they evolve. And you have some of the same interests in this area as management does, because the studios don't want to be squeezed right. out of That's, And we don't want to get squeezed out either. But right. again, the ace we have in the hole, the directors have it, the writers have it, and we have it, is that we have, we have consummate professionals who know what they're doing and are brilliant at what they do. That's the core of this whole thing, and that's the whole core of unionism. That's a good place for me to, to s acknowledge the fact that your service on the uh, board, which is uncompensated, and the effort you're spending on, on running mm -hmm. is something that, just as Ned's effort to get on the board and to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, Unite for Strength's effort to then spend a lot of time doing volunteer unpaid work right. uh, is impressive and should be acknowledged. Thank you. It's, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've been doing this for 14, 14 years, and uh, I've served on... 50 committees, uh, like I told you, I've been on 15 negotiating committees, chaired 10 of them. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, uh, it's, I always feel honored. I always feel privileged to do it. Um, it's an honor to work for and, and, and to be able to represent my fellows and try to get the best I can for all of us. And, and you were elected as an alternate, actually, but have been spending a lot of time substituting for actual board members. But this last, yeah, the last couple of times I've been elected as an alternate. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I've been a full national board member many times. I was elected twice uh, vice president of the Screen Actors Guild um, in 1999 and 2001. Uh, not, I w not the vice president. There were 12 vice presidents at the time, four in Hollywood, four in New York, and four around the country. But yeah, I was elected by the members as a, as a, as a national vice president. Um, yeah, you know, it's, buddy, as I say, up and down. <laughs> full <Absolutely. blown laughs> full blown board member, alternate, and maybe, and hopefully I'll stay within that bandwidth. Let's get Anne Marie on. Sure. Thank you, um, thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Jonathan. It's a pleasure, man. Absolutely. Thank Likewise. you so much. Oops, I'm not going to knock over my water a second time. 
another union should be doing this, but I'm doing it myself. I, you know, absolutely. We're, <laughs> we are a non-union production. I, uh, I don't think this qualifies me for AFTRA. No. <laughs> I don't know. What's your budget level? Um, pretty low. This is the new media world. Yeah, it is. And, and welcome to it. And welcome to the Thank show, Andrew Johnson. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, you know, because I've asked my slate, as it were, of questions to, uh, to David, I'm going to start by uh, asking you to address what you'd like to to supplement David's answers or point to other things. And I'll, I'll probably follow up with that and ask you something. Well, first of all, I think it just shows the caliber of uh, qualified uh, candidates that we have. I mean, uh, uh, our board, our candidates make up over 170 years of experience. You can't match that. This is not the time to learn on the job. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. And I'm just, I'm always, I mean, I've known David for a long time, and we've served on the board together for almost 12 years together. Well, I'll jump in and say that experience has uh, nonetheless led you to stalemate in this contract. It's not the experience that led us to stalemate. It's but our it employers that have led us to stalemate. And the also experience uh, hasn't, cu hasn't cured that so far. No, but the experience has kept us alive and not settling for uh, a deal that would decimate performers. Go on. <laughs> okay. You asked something uh, under the leadership of uh, Membership First, have things been better? I believe that was your question. And, uh, and David uh, beautifully articulated uh, the majority of the issues. What he did leave out, and I know he, I know he didn't leave it out on purpose, but um, we also renegotiated the first time in 24 years the basic cable contract. And that increased our residual platforms for basic cable, which hadn't been uh, increased since 1986. And we did that w with the strike authorization, but without using the strike authorization. And it was a phenomenal success. And as David mentioned earlier, every actor who works on a Screen Actors Guild basic cable show receives a residual check every time their show airs. And when, when was that negotiation? We renegotiated that contract in 2006. So 20, I guess 20 years Roughly, Tw roughly yeah, and there no yeah. so so for f that was such a huge success in that in that area because uh, basic cable is probably more exciting and more entertaining that w when, than what we see on uh, primetime television. It's a place where a lot of producers want to be, and we mm -hmm. secured phenomenal contracts for our for our Screen Actors Guild actors. And also, I also want to say that even <laughs> though Membership First was not around during the two thousand commercial strike. Um, the extension of that contract from the results of that strike protected Class A residuals and held on to our jurisdiction in, in the Internet, new media. So, and, and Membership First at the time did hold the majority uh, when the contract was extended, and it's a phenomenal contract and actors are very pleased. Isn't there, e even now, a difficulty with basic cable because the, the rates are less than network prime time, and perhaps because of that in part, as well as the freer or looser standards and practices restrictions, um, you're seeing uh, networks and producers moving to basic cable for, for the good, better and better scripted programming. And ironically, you're seeing the sort of, you know, you, um, cable used to be the home of reality type programming, documentary. You're seeing reality moving to the network. So there's almost a swap in part because of the different budget levels. There is a swap, but for the actor's life, we're not in this for the money. We're in this to hopefully earn a middle class living and qualify for some semblance of health care. But we're, we're excited that Basic Cable is the home for phenomenal scripted programming. And we're also quite excited that when, a screen, when an actor works on a Basic Cable show that happens to be under Screen Actors Guild contract, you mm -hmm. will get compensated and you will be treated fairly and you will have the same wages and working conditions as you would have in our other contracts and, and, and we did the right thing and unfortunately after it did not do the right thing and we allowed our membership to vote on the basic cable contract after it did not. They made those decisions without the endorsement or lack thereof of their membership. After is actually, do they have a blanket basic cable agreement or they're doing individual agreements They have individuals. They right? have individuals. And uh, unfortunately, these are contracts that they uh, are very reluctant to show their members. Um, David had mentioned the conversation with one of the stars of Bold and the Beautiful. Um, she's not the only actor who has come t uh, to our help who have asked for the Screen Actors Guild to be involved. Um, we've had other casts from um, basic cable shows, after basic cable shows, coming to our offices crying when they finally realized how they were duped, how their representatives were duped, and how they were not provided a copy of their contract to make sure exactly how they were duped. Because when they signed their personal service agreement, um, certain information about residuals was conveniently left out. So members 
um, are not even getting copies of the contract. Members are by. not getting copies in, of the in contract. In general, or is that, when is they that almost exclusive? When, it, well, uh, as far as we know, with the, the actors who have come to us, even our own board, Many of our Screen Actors Guild members uh, have gone to the ninth floor at 5757 Boulevard and requested to seek master agreements and, and contracts, copies of the contracts, and they've been denied that. I, I do know that I've been denied that as a member of the yes. blogging press, as it were. You have um, been denied that. <laughs> I How do you feel about that? I think that that's a lack of transparency. And, uh, you know, I have, uh, you know, my position on these various issues you know, as I think I've conveyed, is a is a mixed one. I do think that some of what membership first is looking for, probably a fair amount of it, is is what uh, actors should be looking for. Um, my, you know, concern, and I, w I will ask you this question, is that there's a lack of uh, acknowledgement that un unfortunately, and in part because of SAG, not entirely, um, because of membership first, uh, there is a lack of leverage in this negotiating cycle, an enormous lack of leverage. Well, I have to interrupt you. There's certainly not a lack of le leverage due to membership first. Well, you guys, um, you guys helped push after close to the door, not completely well, out no, the door. No, we did not. Uh, uh, but I have to clarify also something. I don't think if you asked any member, any Screen Actors Guild member who's been at this for a while, who's had the disadvantage of working on an after show, but the advantage of working on a Screen Actors show, um, if they thought it was fair that our sister union, as, as David clearly said, but I'll repeat it uh, for maybe our, your viewers who've just joined us, uh, a, a union that represents no features and less than 10%, probably about 5 6% of primetime scripted television, should have 50% of the say in negotiations. I think if you asked any member who's been fortunate enough to work in this business, they would just laugh in your face and say, how do you allow this to happen? And by the way, I didn't say it was fair. I said that trying to change it six months before expiration is, was likely to blow up well, in your face. Well, I have to and tell you. Have no room to it, fix the problem. Well, I think we need to reverse the question. And uh, fair is irrelevant. In my, I, I, I've been negotiating not as long as David, but this is the fifth contract I've negotiated. And I've always implored to my members of the negotiating committee, please not use the word fair. There is nothing fair in this business. And it's not about fair. It's about being a participant. It's about being um, not dis it's about being franchised and not disenfranchised. But fair and respect are two words that you need to leave at home because it has <laughs> no place in negotiations. Um, was it proper for AFTRA while the Screen Actors Guild was negotiating our basic cable contract to go in and undercut us? It dawned on us then that Hmm, John Connolly, who was the former president of AFTRA, was correct. When AMA failed, he assured us that AFTRA would do whatever they could to undercut the Screen Actors Guild. Explain what AMA is. AMA was the um, Uber union that was going to be created out of the uh, consolidation affiliation, uh, CNA proposal, the merger, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. and, and the beautiful branded institution of the Screen Actors Guild and the institution of AFTRA was going to be going to dissolve into this uber union called AMA. And when AMA failed, John Connolly made it very public that AFTRA was going to move ahead, they were in financial straits. That's why they were advocates of AMA, because they were in financial straits. And the only way out of that was to merge with a larger entity, which could bail them out of a lot of red crossed out in a lot of their paperwork. So when that failed, John Connolly and others within AFTRA and others within the Screen Actors Guild, who fortunately are no longer uh, at 5757 Wilshire Boulevard, decided, you know what, uh, now we're going to spank you and we're going to spank you hard and this is how we're going to do it. And Membership First got together and we said, we are not going to allow this sister union to try to diminish the earning capability and the uh, capability of a member to make a decent living. But you didn't have the leverage to not allow them to do you something. You like that word leverage, don't you? Uh, that's the word in negotiation, not fair. But leverage. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of words in negotiations, one of which we haven't heard is best and final. We've heard final, but we certainly haven't heard best, last, and final. So I just wanted to clarify that. What we've heard is final. We've which also means heard uh, we won't negotiate anymore. We, but we studios. are negotiating. Um, 
Leverage is a word that, that is bantied about quite often. Obviously, I'm, uh, obviously, we would rather be in a better position, but we are where we are. We gain our leverage because we are control, along with our other unions, of the content. We also will gain leverage when the members actually read in black and white how horrific the WGA, DGA, and after contract is for actors who want to not be hobbyists, but who want to make a living in this business. Are well, the actors and after hobbyists? No, no, no. What, I may, what I'm saying is there are some actors in AFTRA and in SAG who don't rely specifically. We have a lot of producers in SAG who mm -hmm. don't rely specifically on our residual schedules. A lot of them? Initial. A lot of producers? Well, we, there are some who actually have very successful production slates. There are others who are just hyphenates because they're fortunate enough to produce independent films. But there are, mm -hmm. members in, there are members across the board who, once they find out, the majority of the members, once they find out, how damaging the after prime time agreement is in a lot of areas, that's when you gain the leverage because it's going to be up to the membership to say, this is just not acceptable. Not to the broadcasters or the recording artists, but to those of us who make our living in front of the cameras. So it sounds like you're saying that with a campaign of education of the members over some reasonably short period. Correct that you may uh, credibly be able to, to develop a 75% threshold. I believe so. So that's, that's the strategy here then. I believe so. And I think it's a very wise strategy. It should always, unlike AFTRA, it, we, the, the National Board of the Screen Actors Guild doesn't, uh, we don't always make the final decisions. We like to send it to our membership to make the decision. Why is there a 75% threshold? You've controlled the board. Why not? Um, why well, not that would be a that? change to the Constitution, and I, yes, think, it I think it's very important to have a, a threshold like that. We don't it, take it, strikes lightly, and it, we have to listen to the membership. I think it would be bad governance if we decided, you know what, now that we have the majority, let's, let's lower the, the, the level of quali the qualifying. I don't think that's correct. It's 75 percent for a reason, and mm -hmm. there's not one person in Membership First who believes, let's take advantage of our majority and lower it. I don't think that's right. Let me ask you to say one last thing, and then what I want to do is go to some questions if we've got any. And that I'll was brief. Uh, that was uh, that was an hour, <laughs> but uh, your part was not an hour. That's right. I'm so I'm so interesting and fascinating, and we buy so quickly. You uh, you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you agree. Yeah. You are too. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you for allowing us to do this. I. As David mentioned, I really was quite a strong advocate of holding a debate and streaming it as, as you mm -hmm. are because I think this is a fabulous way for the member to see what's really going on. And had we had a debate, I think it would have been answered. The question would have been answered. Membership First is far beyond more prepared to deal with what's going on at the Screen Actors Guild than Unite for Strength. Not one of them. I think maybe two of their candidates, one actually for AFTRA and the other one for the Screen Actors Guild, spent any time in our W&Ws. I've never seen... Uh, Ned Vaughn at a membership meeting. I've, I haven't seen the majority of their candidates at a membership meeting, and I used to chair those membership meetings. So I've never seen any of their candidates, except for maybe one, at our open board meetings, which we hold once a month on Monday from 6 to 9 and on. That's so the Hollywood board. Our board. Hollywood board, under membership first, for the first time in history of the Screen Actors Guild, board members were open to, the, to our members. I've never seen any of them. So I'm quite curious to find out why now they think they're qualified to do a job that takes a, it's a huge, huge process to understand the ins and outs of the Screen Actors Guild. And um, I encourage anyone to want to run, but un, uh, I, I question their motives. Let me take some questions if we've, uh, if we've got any. So go ahead. If you've got questions, please type them into the chat window. I find this fascinating. Thanks. Thanks very much. It's um, a great way. Now that you're all alone in bargaining after letting, after letting the Writers Guild go out first, uh, <laughs> how will you improve on the current, the current LBF? Uh, last best final. The last first of all, we have no say in when the Writers Guild go in or go out. <laughs> I mean, we are, we are a powerful union, but we're not that powerful. It's up to the Writers Guild when they decide to go in, and it's also up to the Writers Guild and their membership when they go out. And it's also a two-way street. It's up to the AMPTP and the Writers Guild sure. when they... But given that they have, how do you improve on the last best and final? We improve by staying at the table. We improve by uh, educating our membership. We improve by not sitting on our hands and, and, and saying the sky is falling. We improve by staying firm and keeping our memberships, membership involved and listening and keeping our finger on the pulse. That's how we improve on it. And by the way, both Dave Young and Patrick Verone has, have told us personally and publicly, please, please improve on the deal that we were given. 
they haven't been very participatory in, in, in your public uh, positioning. They came to one rally, which I was at. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I saw you there. Thank uh, you. You were there, but not a lot of Unite for Strength people were there. You should be running for the board. You're more involved than the Unite for Strength candidates. Well, I don't know about that, but I, of course I'd have to become a member first. You can do it. I well we'll we'll I see think about you that. You've got the looks. I think you have the articulate. I think you can do it. All right then. Or That's you right. can also join after first, and then try to get in ours because we have preference of employment. Yeah. It's but a little harder. Let's see. That's uh, right. Let's see uh, additional questions here. Writers, writer, woo, uh, stop typing for a minute, please. Writers <laughs> Guild <laughs> leadership said your internal squabble with AFTRA forced their hand <laughs> in going out first. Isn't it time to drop that fight with that? Patrick Verone and, and David Young have never stated that. They have been, they understand the internal struggles. They've experienced it themselves with Writers Guild East and Writers Guild West. There has not been- a, Not at the level that SAG has. Well, in they separated. <laughs> so that's but what else years ago, but in, they needless, they to say, needless to say, needless to say, the Writers Guild has been publicly quite, quite supportive of Doug Allen, Allen Rosenberg, and the board of the Screen Actors Guild, which is predominantly made up of membership first board members. So we have their full support, and as I said earlier, they want us to do what we can. And I need to add something that David may have forgotten. There was mm -hmm. no favored nation clause with AFTRA. So Except as to uh, force majeure. Well, force majeure because it actually affects our contract. Uh, but um, it's quite it's quite curious. I think it's still the continuing uh, um, their goals to undercut us in all areas. I think that's why there's no favored nation attached. If you've got the full support of the Writers Guild, um, I'm saying their leadership. I don't know. If you've got the full support of their leadership. That was the the next Sorry. word in my question. Um, <laughs> Good pair. Um, we. I think we could take this. I think we take this across the country. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll uh, we'll see about the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. But if you've got the full support under a sad contract, Go ahead, why haven't they been uh, making statements? You know, the DGA. Made no, a, well, the, the DGA, DGA made a statement and that they he stepped the on deal. it. And and well, the, the, writers guild, the writers guild hasn't come because out, out of quite uh, because the writers guild is a lot more savvy and respects us to the umpteenth and respects uh, Doug Allen to such a level, they know when it's time to come in and say what they need to say. We have absolutely no doubt that the Writers Guild support us now. They'll su they supported us yesterday, they support us today, and they'll support us tomorrow. Let's see if we've got another question here. Unlike the DGA and Michael Apted. Okay, stop typing for a minute, please. Question, are there any circumstances under which a single actor's union would make sense the wall between SAG and AFTRA seems so sadly polluted right now, and ye yet there are economics to having just uh, economies to yeah, having sure. this one actors' union. Yes, I agree. I think all actors need to be under one union, and that union is the Screen Actors Guild. Will AFTRA agree to give up power and do that? That's really not my concern. It's up to the membership. AFTRA is quite concerned with their institution, but they have very little concern about their members. Our concern is about the membership and not about our institution. And I believe, I believe the average actor within both unions, actor within, but within both unions, would be quite pleased to be under the protection of the Screen Actors Guild. What's the worst part of AFTRA's deal and why shouldn't we accept it? I think David articulated quite qu clearly the uh, worst part of AFTRA's deal. It just doesn't satisfy the needs, as far as we're concerned, of the, of the actor, specifically the middle class actor. And they left, the, uh, they left the stunt community out to dry also. We can't forget that the stunt community is a huge community within the Screen Actors Guild, bringing a lot of money and a lot of uh, money to uh, support and feed our pension and health, and AFTRA left them out to dry. There are a lot of so they're a big part of AFTRA as well, you're saying? Uh, no, but the contract that the, the primetime contract that AFTRA uh, ratified leaves the uh, stunt community out of the lurch. Well, and they're not that represented by AFTRA. Well, why they are. Why Our stunt community is represented by both unions. But if new projects are under the AFTRA contract, stunt coordinators are left out to dry. Some uh, stunt pilots won't even be recognized as union members. So they weren't. They uh, left out a very respectful community out. Of, of the participation aspect, and, and that doesn't satisfy us whatsoever. So there are a lot of uh, negatives about the after contract that the Screen Act, if you want more details, just go to SAG.org or come to an open board meeting, come to our membership meetings, and we'll certainly keep you up to date, which I find interesting. Someone texted me saying Ned Vaughn really didn't, Ned Vaughn of Unite for Strength, mm -hmm. didn't really mm -hmm. know what was going on in negotiations, didn't really know what our proposals were, didn't really know where we were today. He would know if he came to our membership meetings. He mm -hmm. would know if he came to an open board meeting. He mm -hmm. would know if he just logged on to sag.org and read. Just simply read. The it's in English. 
the next question there was whose idea was it to go it alone with Doug Allen's or Members it was after his idea to go it alone in in this current negotiations mm -hmm. after I walked out in March uh, about two weeks uh, before we were to start negotiations, after uh, we went through the whole W&Ws together, both AFTER and SAG members of the W&W voted up the final package together. There were tears. There was a standing O for our phenomenal chairs, specifically David Jolliffe. And then, poof, they found the reason to get out. They were always looking for a reason to get out. And they found the slim reason called Bold and the Beautiful. Whose idea was it? to seek block voting, proportional representation. It was it was an idea or dissolving phase one. It was it was an idea well, dissolving phase one actually came from an outcry of the membership. Which, which membership first listened to, specifically in, in, in Hollywood, specifically in Lo Los Angeles, and we represent the, the core of the performers in this union. There was an outcry. They thought that 50-50 was just absolutely reprehensible. So it, we were answering the concerns of the membership. Um, the Hollywood board was quite interested in figuring out how can we make this equitable for Screen Actors Guild members and actors in general. Doug Allen presented to us the, the aspect of block voting. We discussed it. We debated it. It. We also were still considering uh, proportional, proportional voting, and uh, we came to the conclusion, listen, we need to negotiate the strongest contract that we have. We were hoping that our brothers and sisters in the RBD and the New York board would see it our way, regardless of the 50-50 vote, and hold firm on certain aspects, which would then overrule any after vote, because historically after has always said, just take the deal, whether it was a good deal or not. And in the long run, after walked out, and here we have it. Isn't there a sort of a principle of keep your friends close but your enemies closer that's not been followed here? Well, uh, who, who hasn't followed it? Well, a little bit of both. If you were pushing for, uh, dissolve, for uh, leaving aside 50-50, dissolving, going Like I said before, after, uh, after I needed to put aside the institution head and think about the members, and I believe they know just as well as we do that sc the Screen Actors Guild would have and is continuing to negotiate for a better contract that they settled. Let me see if there's one last question. And, um, <laughs> is, there any, um, is there any rule that requires SAG to take a, a bad deal in this questioner's uh, view just because the Writers Guild, uh, Directors Guild, and after Brilliant. You have very good viewers. That was I a very was good question. I, was I compliment, to. is that the camera? I compliment you guys. That's a very good question. There's a, we're under no obligation to take the WJ or the DGA deal. As Doug Allen and those of us in Membership First have always said, it's better to have no deal than a bad deal. So we're under no obligation whatsoever. Is it really better to have no deal for m maybe months on end? Sure it is. In fact, I forget, maybe it's in, uh, <coughs> there are other unions who've negotiated for 15, 16 months and worked under the deal that had expired. So it's not an oddity. Uh, we're, we're certainly not uh, the slowest bunch in the, in the crowd of unions. And I think, I think our brothers and sisters up in Canada negotiated for 15 months. So we might be looking at 15 months? No, of course not. Here? I'm just giving you an example. And um, th this will be the final one. Um, how do you propose to galvanize support for a strike vote? Education. Outreach, education. Outreach, education. Transparency, transparency. Unlike the leadership in AFTRA, the Screen Actors Guild, specifically since 2004, 2005, probably more 2005, we believe in transparency. We believe in listening to the members, mm -hmm. unlike AFTRA. So, education, outreach, involvement. Members, uh, Unite for Strength says that they want the best contract for actors, and it looks like they agree with at least a number of positions you've taken on the issues. Mm -hmm. So I find it fascinating, don't you? Well, where are the differences, and why shouldn't we, you need why to shouldn't ask we elect some of them? You need to ask Ned. Well, <laughs> uh, I'll try to be kind. You should ask that to Ned. But I find an intro. I was also text. I'm sorry I missed Ned's, but I'll see it. I'm, I'm right, sure it'll archive. Yeah. Right. Uh, he also met when <coughs> I think you were talking about merger. He made a he made a statement. He really doesn't care about the legacy of the Screen Actors Guild. He doesn't care if it's ex extinguished. He mm -hmm. doesn't care if the union is called Uncle Joe's Acting Union. Just as long as uh, the Screen Actors Guild and AFTRA get together and and merge and become a stronger union, I find that pretty much the uh, icing on a very distasteful cake. The Screen Actors Guild has been around for 75 years. It is a brand that is respected globally. 
and to flippantly say that you don't care if it's called Uncle Joe's Acting Union says a lot about who you are as a unionist. That's a time to uh, conclude. Thank, Thank you very you. much for being here. I really enjoyed this. Thank well, you. Well, likewise, and I give you the same acknowledgement I gave David, which is that... Um, oh, and I'm not an incumbent. You're not, I have but you seen. have been in the... Sure, you're, I've... I've, I've you're not, you are an incumbent, seat. but you're not up for re-election. But I'm not up for re-election, no. Right, so you're spending the time <laughs> and uh, the uncompensated time doing some of the Because I love, I love actors, mm. I love the life I lead, and I want to keep it that way, and I love the Screen Actors Guild. What I'd like to ask... Um, my viewers to do is to tell your friends that this will be archived. Come to my blog, jhandle.com, to uh, get the link to find the, uh, the archive. Uh, I'm very glad to have had representatives of both the challengers, Unite for Strength, and the um, incumbents, Membership First, to have been with us. Uh, look also on my blog for what I hope will be future broadcasts with, the, um, with board members after the election, and I've also invited both SAG and the AMPTP, the SAG staff and the AMPTP, to join me as well, which would presumably be, if at all, after the elections. The, um, their decision on that is uh, not yet released. Thank you very much for joining me and joining all of us.